Okay. So we've got half an hour. So um, I've just done a seminar that was 40 minutes long and it only just fitted when I missed bits out. So I'm going to drive some of you mad because I'm going to miss some bits out early on that you're going to think I'd really like to hear about that, you academic learning types. And some of you are going to be saying, I'm so glad he's missing that bit out and I will be in that position. But it will make sense why. Oh, you at, another group, at the end of the seminar, I'm going to give you a link to the paper that I've written on this and all the bits I've missed out are explained in the paper. And that's all the academic background to it that I don't fully understand. Oh, no, I shouldn't, sorry, delete that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're thinking about um, helping people to learn in church. And um, I don't know if you've ever had this experience as a church minister when you've been frustrated with people in your church. None of you, obviously this has been recorded, your church members can watch this. Uh, they can hear you say, so you can be identified by your laugh. So you know, no, they, they've never been frustrated by people in church. And um, sometimes I've had that sense of, weren't they listening to what I said? I feel like I'm not getting through. We just preached a sermon on love, and I'm seeing people shouting at each other in a church meeting. And I say, it just doesn't make sense. What, why are we not doing it? I'm preaching, I'm reaching our community, and no one will do anything. And you get that sense of real frustration sometimes, like people just aren't understanding and grasping what you're trying to teach. Why, what, why is that? Is there a problem? And I find this bit of research interesting. This is uh, quite old now, but I think it's still broadly true. In early 2006, some research was conducted by the Evangelical Alliance, which revealed that the low levels of biblical knowledge and understanding was becoming a significant and worrying issue in the church. And I think... I think, still think that's broadly true. I think people generally are relying on what they receive on a Sunday morning. Now, I need to say, before I say what I'm going to say next, that's their fault. You know, they, they should read the Bible for themselves. And, all, and I believe that, and that's all true. But having said that, because we're loving people, we need to do our best to teach people. And I think one of the things that we do as ministers sometimes that's not very helpful is we say, well, if they're not learning, it must be all their fault. Can't be me, can it? I was trained in a Bible college. I'm a professional. <laughs> One of the things that worries me about what I've picked up from some ministers about how they've been trained to preach and teach is it feels to me a bit like this, like a direct download, like you're passing on information in a rational uh, style. Here I am, I'm lecturing you and I'm giving you this information. And I'm really concerned about that because I think one of the things that we need to learn to do is to stop thinking, what am I teaching, and start thinking, what are people going to learn from this? Because as soon as you start saying, I wonder what they're going to learn from this, it makes you think about it differently. Because when you approach a sermon, you're going to preach a sermon on uh, whatever topic. Give me a topic. What are we going to preach on? Love. Love. Preaching a sermon on love. Preaching a sermon on love. And I want to tell everyone in my congregation everything there is about love in the next 25 minutes, or 20 minutes, or 10 minutes, or however long you get. And so we read all the books, we do all the research, we have 52 pages of notes on love and the Greek words and diagrams for the nice Greek words, not the other word. And uh, we have all this kind of stuff about love. And I went, I prepared it, I'm going to give you all of it, I'm going to let you have it right between the eyes, because I've worked hard on this. And so, when I think, what am I going to teach, I give them everything. When I stop and think, what do I want people to learn from this, I think, if I give them to this, they're going to have breakdowns, they're never going to cope with all this. So I'm going to pick these five things, and I'm going to put some information in the handout that those who are interested can find more. Do you, you see what I mean? It gives you a different uh, attitude. Uh, we're going to watch a video clip. I can't bear to miss the video clip out. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, light bulb. Gru is trying everything he can to get into this fortress and he can't do it. He's done everything he knows how to do. This is what he's been trained to do. This is how it works. He's just not getting anywhere. And then he sees the girls just knock on the door and offer cookies and he has this light bulb moment. And my prayer is that we would have more light bulb moments. So uh, I find this interesting. This circulated on the internet a year or so ago, a few years ago. And the question is with school like this and work like this, it made sense for church to look like this. So with school looking like this and work like this what should church look like and I, I find that a really challenging and the thing I like about this question is there's actually not a right or wrong answer and it's almost not what should it look like but how, how should we do it how can we go about it and the answer in our context will be different but somehow we I think the, the time for burying our head in the sand and saying the way we did church a hundred years ago still works today and will grow churches and get new Christians in I think you know I just personally think we're deluding ourselves. We can we can maintain churches like that, uh, but I, I get the impression some of our larger churches may if they carry on the way. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a large church, but some churches are so traditional. Our larger churches and the respectable Christians like that. And in 40 or 50 years time, those churches are going to be dead. I think unless something changes. That's an opinion, not the ABA's opinion. Just making that clear for the camera. Uh, right, uh, so what are we talking about next? Uh, which boat would you rather be on? Pleasure cruise or the rowing -y thingy, what's it? Pleasure, anyone? Pleasure cruise. Pleasure yeah. cruise. Yeah. Anyone not pleasure cruise? Depends on the rowing one. I knew it was Oh, look at that. Some people are like, yeah, give me an oar. Yeah. But yeah. not if it was going thousands of miles. Yeah, not for thousands of miles. Yeah. Most churches set up like a pleasure cruise. Come to our church, we can meet all your needs. I'm the minister, I'll be preaching a sermon today. We've got Sunday school for your children. Uh, come on, they'll be nice and quiet out there and we won't bother us till you come back. We've got tea and coffee. Don't worry, it's good coffee. And uh, I've done proper stuff. And we do all this sort of, we've got comfy chairs. We've got rid of the plastic ones. We don't have peers over, we've got nice comfy chairs. Don't worry. We've come to make you comfortable. Come to make you comfortable. And there's nothing wrong with that to a point. Until you realise that there are 57 one another in commands in the New Testament. And when you realise that there'll be a significant number of people in your congregations that only engage with Christian things communally on a Sunday morning. So if you're not giving them space on a Sunday morning to encourage one another, to build one another up, to participate together, then you're making it difficult for them to obey the Bible. And that's not an ideal <coughs> scenario for a minister, really, isn't it? Now I realise they have the choice to go to home group, they can do that after the services and all that sort of thing. But actually to stop and think how do we get people to participate isn't just a thing uh, that's to do with uh, being modern and connecting with people. I think it's a biblical way to do church. And I realise it's difficult for those of us who are leading larger churches, that's hard to do stuff that's participatory. Uh, but it's something we need to reflect on. How do we include one another in? Who wants to be in this picture? Wonderful, isn't it? By the fire, a mug of hot chocolate. Wonderful. And it's just the perfect picture of how many church members view church. I come to church to be comfortable, I come to be encouraged, I come to feel good. And one of the things that I did my research, I wondered, is whether passive members are partly a result of the way we do church. Because we treat them as customers sometimes, don't we? And I know, I'm doubt if any of us intend to do that, but it's just the way lots of churches work. 
And actually then we frustrated when they won't do stuff. And actually it's because we set them up in this thing where they, they come to listen and they come and we do stuff to them and they just join in. And actually I think participating and getting people to get stuck in and join in uh, creates a different uh, ethos and a culture in a church. So I also think people are interested in what's helpful and real. So this is one of our church values, discovering God in the everyday. And one of the things we have at Orchard Baptist Church is we want people to come to church and hear something that's going to equip them to live out their faith in the week. And that's just one of our, so that's one of the things that's on the front of our bus, uh, to use the language from the other day. So I did some research on learning styles, because I've always done this stuff instinctively. My background is youth work. And when you go to a group of young people and say, I've come to preach you a sermon, it doesn't always go very well. And you soon learn on the fly that you have to take a variety of approaches. And I brought that with me into church. So I did some research on learning styles so I could learn to do it properly. Uh, this is the most well-known learning style, uh, VAC, visual auditory, uh, kinesthetic, uh, or doing. Uh, and so the best way of understanding it is if you were to get a new gadget, a new phone, uh, then what would you do? Uh, would you read the manual? Some people are like, yeah, can't wait, need to read the instructions, I need to see what to do. Some people, I'd ring someone up to talk about it. I can't be doing with reading the manual, but if I ring my grandson, or perhaps my granddad, you have any hands out here? They can explain it to me. I need to listen to someone. I need to engage and talk to someone about this. And some people would like, oh, I can't be doing with any of that. I'm just going to turn it on. Yeah. They don't care if I break it. I'm just I'm learning by having a go at this thing. And there might be a nuclear code launch button on here. I'm still going to learn by having a go. I'm sure it'll be okay. <laughs> we can't just can't help ourselves, can we? There was someone called Gardner, and he came up with this thing called multiple intelligences. And I love this because this goes beyond the academic. And I'm glossing over this very quickly. And don't despair about that. This is the bit I said at the beginning, I will gloss over. And you can read about it in the paper at the end. But I do like this because it goes beyond the academic. So Gardner says, some people uh, have verbal linguistic intelligence, which a simple phrase called word smart. Some people are good with words. Some people are logical, mathematical types. They're analytical and rational, give me a Sudoku kind of person. Some people are visual, spatial intelligence people. And they have the potential to recognise and use the patterns of wide space and that sort of thing. Some people have musical intelligence. Some people have bodily kinesthetic intelligence, you know, well-coordinated, sporty people like me. Uh, some people have interpersonal intelligence and they understand people and how they work. Some people have intrapersonal uh, intelligence, uh, which is self-smart, that they are self-aware, they're reflective types. Uh, and later Gardner added an eighth form, which is naturalist intelligence, which is a perception of and relationship with the natural environment. And Gardner would say, you're not necessarily one of these, you can be a combination of these. But that's quite interesting. What I love about this is it says to uh, the, the kind of 16-year-old who's failed all their GCSEs, but loves taking an engine to pieces and putting it back together, and they can do it, you are intelligent too. And that's mm -hmm. what's really helpful mm -hmm. about Gardner and uh, his approach. There's Kolb, who had a learning cycle, uh, which uh, is helpful for reflection. You have an experience, you reflect on your experience, you think about your reflection, having reflected and gained all this information, I'm thinking, about what am I gonna do differently? And then you experiment with doing something differently. If only church is an experiment, it'd be wonderful. Uh, experiment, then we're gonna have an experience, and then we're gonna go around in circles. And actually, if we could l teach our churches that this is a good thing, our lives would be so much easier. If we could develop a culture that says, if we try something it doesn't work, it's okay, because this is our cycle of learning. This is where we're going together. That's an aside. So Kolb, alongside this, came up with his four learning styles, which are diverging, which is to do with feeling uh, and watching in life, uh, assimilating, which is to do with watching and thinking, but it's to do with the two parts of the learning cycle either side, uh, accommodating, which is to do with uh, doing and feeling, very hands-on people, and information, uh, and that's people, oh sorry, uh, miss one out, Nike, what's the word miss out? Converging. These people enjoy solving problems, and they never miss things out on bits of paper, either, I don't think, I know, I'm not sure about that. Now the reason I've just glossed over that very quickly, is you can read all about that in the thing at the end, and uh, and you'll see more in a minute. There's someone called Honey and Mumford, and they used the cycle, but they came up with their own uh, headings, which you may have heard of. And their headings are reflectors, uh, and that's uh, patient in gathering information, will listen before speaking. Theorists, who are logical in approach, and they will assimilate and disparate facts and coherent theories. Pra oh, sorry, pragmatists, <coughs> and they love new ideas, uh, and are very hands-on. And activists, who are outgoing extroverts. 
Now, there's another one. I'm just going to flick on and flick off because at the moment, all I'm doing is doing what I said at the beginning was really bad. I've fired lots of information about you, and I doubt, if we had a test now, I doubt any of you would have any idea what most of those headings were. It's interesting, isn't it? That's the only way I can do it in this seminar slump. So there's Bloom's taxonomy of their names, and uh, this is helpful, mainly on physical skills, intellectual capability, uh, attitudes or feelings. So that's his, and then he has, um, you develop in each area depending on where you are. And the reason I've glossed over all those so quickly is I did all this research, and this is how I felt. <laughs> I, I, I don't cry much, but I really, I came very close to tears. So I did this to teach me how to teach people in church. And I felt like some of you feel now. You just find all this stuff at me and I didn't really catch it all. I didn't understand it all. It's certainly not useful because how can you take 32 learning styles and apply them to your church? And I remember, I can't remember the process, but I remember kind of saying to God, God, I'm really frustrated about this. And I had a light bulb moment. <laughs> and the light bulb moment was, if I took all of those headings and converged them into other headings, I could make sense of it. And that is what I did. And lavish learning was born. Lavish learning. So, logical, rational covers all of those things that I said earlier, but you didn't quite understand or grasp. Uh, active hands-on covers all those things that I said earlier. Uh, visual covers all those things. Interactive, participation, space and reflection, and heart feelings and emotions. So what I've done, I've taken all the main learning style theories and I've made them usable. Because uh, that's what I do. That's my approach. Like, I take things that are complicated and make them simple. So you may look at that and go, that's a bit funny, isn't it? But on the other hand, that's a tool that we can use. And so then what we're going to do for the rest of our time is just look through these six areas and come up with some ideas, which is probably what you came for in the first place. So logical, rational, I'm going to go quite quickly because uh, we do sermons in our churches that hopefully are clear and well explained. Uh, they're not always. Uh, sometimes people don't understand what we're talking about. If we use theological language, there'll be people who won't get it. When I came to Orchard Baptist Church on my first Sunday, Orchard Baptist Church has many fine preachers, but a lady said to me, who'd been in that church for several years, that's the first sermon I've understood all the way through. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to hear that. Mm -hmm. We need to hear that. The preachers in our church are not theologically trained. It's not that they're using big words like marmalade. They're just talking in their own Christian language and experience. And part of the reason they called me was to train them to do different. Uh, thankfully, the church is a different place. It was a good place already, but it's a better place now. Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And I think sometimes in, in some of my churches, people have said, will you stop explaining stuff so simply and just get on with it? Because actually, if I join a new club, I won't understand what's going on. And that's a very rational sensible comment but actually my response is well are we not more loving than that when someone comes in who doesn't know Jesus yet do I not want them to understand what's going on do I not want them to feel secure do I not want them to feel accepted so much that I'm taking time to explain to them uh, what's going on so sermons that are clear and well explained uh, something I learned to do years ago I had someone who was really driven nuts in all age services because they were a logical type so one of the things that I do now is in an all age service I have something that I thought that I lob in that has nothing to do with the theme and I always make it look like it's an aside, never on the PowerPoint. And uh, so I'll give you an example. This is an example. If Jesus talked about the kingdom and not the church, then why are we obsessed about the church, but we rarely talk about the kingdom? I don't know. Anyway, back to what we were talking about. We're going to do this. But your logical, rational people are completely lost in that thought. They've grasped the question and they're engaging with it in their minds. And then you can do Play-Doh and all that sort of stuff, and they're quite happy in their own little world, mulling away. Uh, you can have questions for supplementary reading, and that can be quite helpful for, for the rational types. That's good. Um, active hands-on. This is a real problem for churches, because when you do hands-on stuff in churches, you get in trouble. Mm. It's my experience. Uh, in church, unless you go to Gunton Baptist Church. Well, I still get into trouble. Oh, do you really? I do, yeah. Oh, that's caught on camera now. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is a communion service we do. So what I've tried to do, our church is fairly wacky, but what I've tried to do is come up with ideas that I think you could probably get away with. But the ideas aren't necessarily for you to copy, they're to, to, to get you ticking over. So this is a communion service we did. And uh, in the communion service, we started off talking about the lost sheep. So these sheep, uh, they were hidden around the church. 
So we got people to go and uh, look for the kids, look for the sheep. They brought them in. We watched a video of the story of the lost sheep. Jesus loves us. We're all lost sheep. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Yes. And then the kids go off to Sunday school to do something more fun. And then we gave everyone a rock not to hit the sheep with, obviously. Uh, we gave everyone a rock and we got people to think about what are your burdens, what are you struggling with, what's going on? And then we reflected on that. And then people held those rocks as we worshipped and as we sung songs about God and God is crying out to God and all that sort of thing. Then as we had communion, usually we have communion where we pass the, the bread and the grape juice back. But we said, what we're going to do this morning, we're going to come to the front for communion. I went all full Anglican for a minute and we're going to lay our rocks down on the communion table. Before you have communion, you need to lay down what it is that's troubling you. You need to give it to Jesus. And they came and they laid it down next to the lost sheep, which they are. And then in a moment of genius before the service, someone I'd already cleaned the stones, but someone said, they're still a bit, how can you expect people to have chalk dust while they're having communion? Ooh, think of that. So if you look on the picture there, there's a Tesco ice cream tub which has got water in it so people can wash their hands. And it was kind of a last minute, oh no, what are we going to do? There's no baby wipes. Oh, this is a bit, no baby wipes in church. What's the world coming to? And so we had people wash their hands just so it would be hygienic. And it actually brought it all together beautifully because they laid stuff down as lost sheep, coming back to Jesus, cleansed themselves and received salvation. Not salvation, you know what symbolically, you understand? And it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And you might be able to get away with that in your church, I don't know. There you go. Um, one of the things we did that you could definitely get away with is we talked about the kingdom of God being like a seed that grows into a huge tree. And so we just gave everyone a seed at the end of the sermon and said, plant it. And as it grows, it's going to remind you of the kingdom of uh, God. It was no? the Sorry? I thought it was the length of the service. <laughs> yes. We're going to watch this cry before I finish, Jeff. Uh, one of the other things we did is we gave people a... Uh, uh, bit of old broken wax crayon and we talked about brokenness and we reflected on that and then we put those in a little uh, we collected them up and we put them in the oven in this heart shaped mould and this is what it produced mm -hmm. and we talked about how brokenness makes something beautiful the only hitch to this is you can't do it you can't heat it and cool it quick enough I don't think I'm Jim Mitchell could come up with a way if you ask him at the end but you have to have here's what I made earlier or do it over two weeks no we did yours we did it. Oh, you've done this, we, haven't you? We've, we've still got them. Oh, brilliant. Excellent. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Really so clever. As nice as yours, it's so clever. And it's not my <laughs> idea. I pinched yeah. that one off someone else. It's a really good idea. And Messy Church, lots of us have done. And we try and incorporate Messy Church stuff on our Sunday morning uh, where appropriate it works for us. Forest Church, some people do, where you go out into the, the world and you walk through the forest. And then you do a Bible teaching. So you could do, the if you were near a beach, you could go to the beach and do the house on a rock and the house on sand, mm. for example. And so you're out and you're walking and you're having a nice time and we're going to stop and have this Bible story and as we walk along we're going to talk about it. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. You can have a creative service, we do these at Orchard Baptist Church and some of our old age services. I tell, we sing a song or two because it's church, right, you've got to sing. Mm. And then I tell a story and then we have space for people to work the story out. So we have a drama space and we have an art space and we have a discussion space and then we have uh, some pens and paper for people to write poetry and that sort of stuff and then we come back and learn from each other and it's brilliant because you plan a service and it take, you only need to pick three or four songs it takes you about a minute to plan the service it's the best service ever <laughs> so I uh, love hands on stuff uh, visual stuff, uh, picture paints a thousand words I love this, one of my favourite pictures it's absolutely beautiful I did a school assembly where we did a reflection on this and uh, it was really interesting thinking about the calming of the storm and for us as ministers, as you look at the calming of the storm, uh, and you see some of the disciples in this picture are still faffing about trying to save the boat, and the storm has passed. That's a picture <coughs> of the church, isn't it? We're sort of flapping around all over the place instead of looking to Jesus. And one of the things that's quite helpful sometimes is just to put a picture up and get, say, that's, and you, that's Lindsay did this morning. Did you? So I missed it because I was trying to get the technology to work. I saw you had a picture up, but just yeah. let's reflect on the picture. Pictures are really helpful. What's it mean to be in Christ? Here's a sermon I did, 60 second version. Man in the space suit doesn't die in space. We're in Christ, we survive in God's presence. People in the bus shelter don't get, on, get, get rained upon. Because we're in Christ, it means that we're safe from things. Star Wars, love Star Wars. Uh, Chewbacca, not Chewbacca, Luke and Han Solo are in the storm. Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Uh, they're in the stormtrooper's outfits, and it's a bit like robes of righteousness stormtrooper outfits because they're, they're surrounded and people treat them like they're ordinary stormtroopers.
stormtroopers. And because we're in robes of righteousness, because we're in Christ, uh, then that sort of thing. And when we're in Christ, we can do things uh, that are impossible, uh, like walking on water. Uh, and a bus. Oh, this is brilliant. I finished preparing this last night, and I came across my in Christ sermon. I did the in the bus three or four years ago, before Anthony Delaney. So tell him I said so. On the bus, and you get in the bus, and you go where the bus is going. And when we're in Christ, we should be going where he's going to, the people he's going to. So you take some imagery, and you bring the whole concept of being in Christ uh, alive. You can use video clips, visual aids, body language, uh, all those sorts of things. Images behind song words is a bit controversial, and I'm not going to get into that. We always have imagery behind our song words, because we, we find it helpful. Uh, we don't use the... Um, any of the main packages because they will only let you put an image behind the whole song but most songs are multi-image layered and so we uh, we have one of our technological operators that actually puts images behind <coughs> live as it goes along and I tried it and I couldn't do it and I'm very technical and so what we try and do I use PowerPoint sometimes rather than the packages uh, but it depends what sort of service we're trying to do but sometimes when you're you're singing something about God being our rock and you look at this picture and you God and what brilliant and safety and, and it brings it all alive. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I was walk, going on a walk actually. When you begin to think this way, I often carry a camera with me, and I was walking down this uh, path here. And as I and, I, and I'm going to say the Lord said to me, and I'm not sure it was that clear. The thought came through my mind. God said He would make my path straight like this path. That looks pretty muddy to me. And that just brought it all alive for me. He makes my path straight, but it doesn't make my path easy. Uh, you can have a visual aid, you've got a mug, uh, and you, in your mug you say, what's in the mug? There's water in the mug, but they don't know that, because it's in a mug. You pour it into a glass and you say, in John's Gospel, chapter 1, it says, no one has seen God, what's in the mug, but Jesus, pour into the glass, he has made God known. You've used that one, haven't you? And, uh, and it's just a simple visual aid. If you're not technological, there are hands-on visual aid stuff you can uh, do as well. Interactive participation, um, discussion groups, uh, simple or single points are important. Always try and start with a non-religious question. Where we go wrong with cafe church sometimes is we start with the theological stuff. Mm -hmm. And our guests don't get it. So if you're doing a service on uh, what's important in life, you'd start by saying something like, if your house was burning down, what would you take with you? And then you make it seem like a random icebreaker and then you pick up on it later. Uh, so that's important. Uh, there's a picture of Mary and Joseph on the road to Bethlehem. You'll never have seen a picture like that before. Uh, one of the things, if you've got churches that won't participate and engage in discussion, and they're saying, we're not, do we're not answering your questions, put a picture up like this, get a provocative one, and say, we're going to think about it for a minute, and then just say, oh, incidentally, is there any thoughts? And you will be astounded that people who said, I'm not answering your questions, will engage with it, because mm -hmm. it triggers something different. I, we've got an old people's group, kind of midweek service thing, and uh, they would never engage with anything until I started using images. And those that can see the images, uh, anyway, they didn't say that out loud. Uh, talk to the person next to you, shout out answers. And we, do some, we do a lot of our teaching interactively, and so we do the thing on Moses, uh, and we were talking about Moses and who he was and what shaped him as the way he was. And I thought there's no point in me making a list of think, who Moses was from Exodus chapter 2. You, they can work that out. And so people shouted stuff out, and they spotted stuff I hadn't thought of, which is interesting. And we had an argument in the middle about whether there were uh, crocodiles in the Nile River, which was quite entertaining too. Uh, so, uh, what's God been up to? Most Sunday at Orchard Baptist Church, there's a slot where I wander around with a microphone, and people just talk about what God's been up to in their lives, that's participating. And you, that's something you can do in a larger church, because it's a bit more controlled. Uh, creative DIY services we talked about. There's a picture of someone who uh, folded a bit of paper up and cut it, and they did, I'm feeding the 5,000. And it was very, very kind of, ooh, clever. Uh, games we can uh, do as well. We can learn through games and activities. So, um, so, for example, in this one, we were learning about how far away we are from God. And however far the children jumped, they couldn't reach the mark of perfection. And so what I did then, I picked up one of them and carried them, a small one, obviously, and carried them in a very appropriate, safeguarded, friendly way. Uh, I picked up uh, carefully at arm's length and put them down, at the, and God, Jesus, dies in our place to bring us to God, sort of thing. So, rhetorical questions, if people won't engage, if people won't ask questions, you can ask a rhetorical question, at least they can think of it. Gosh, we've got three minutes left. Uh, space of reflection, that's appropriate. Uh, often we cram our services too full of stuff, like I'm doing now. And um, what we need to do is realise that quiet is a gift. 
we can do contemplative, we can do led meditations in services, we can have prayer spaces, and if you don't know what that is, you have to ask me at the end or Google it. And there's a great website there you can get ideas from. They're fantastic things if you've not come across them. Um, but we use lead meditation a lot. I tell a story from the Gospels and then say, just imagine you're there and at the end of it, Jesus comes and sits next to you and says, I've been meaning to tell you something. Just listen to it. Just talk with it now. And it just triggers something in people and they uh, engage in it. Uh, heart and emotion, uh, music. And you look at people's faces on that picture and they haven't walked around the conference looking like that, have they? This is what music has done as they were. It's, it's, it's kind of ironing the toilet kind of uh, pose for some of them. But I, don't know, I, don't know. I wish I could take that picture off now, I can't. Uh, storytelling, speaking with passion, and something like a story that can invoke emotion. A really well told story is very effective. Real life, making yourself vulnerable. And when you stand before the congregation, I was preaching, we've been preaching through a series on shape. Uh, and any of you are familiar with that about personality and who we are and I was sharing them about my experiences and saying do you know in, in my ministry there have been people who said to me you should not be in the ministry you're not called to this and that left me feeling so broken I shared some of that with people and that engages with people on a heart level as you make yourself vulnerable <coughs> humour is very effective if you use it wisely video clips you've also uh, talked about uh, ice cream do you like ice cream? Love ice cream. Uh, we all like different flavours. Learning styles of flavours. What yours? What's yours? Someone else will hate. Marmite. Who likes Marmite? Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? For ice cream. Do you like ice cream? Well, I'm ready to go to the next session. For all our lives, it provokes a response, doesn't it? And the trouble with the learning style stuff is some people hate what is not their thing. And one of the things we need to educate our churches in when we do some of this stuff is it's not your church. This, this service is not for you. Or you, it's for us. And I had someone who said to me after one of the services I did, Do you know, if you hadn't shown that third video clip, it would have been perfect. And I said, Can someone just pull, push out the door, please? There's a great because I can't quite hear myself. Because someone, um, it's not your church, and that third video clip was not for you, it was for the children who were disengaging at that point. And actually, the Bible says we need to prefer one another in love, we need to consider others better than ourselves. And what is the Christian attitude? And often these people who criticise us are taking a holier than thou attitude. And if we can actually reflect back and challenge them and say, what does the Bible say about preferring one another, about putting one another first? And how do we apply that to this sort of thing? So we need each other. If you like some of this, but you think, oh my goodness, that is so not me. Um, that's why you have a church full of people. It's called the body of Christ. You've have heard of that. And you need to learn how can you draw in your creatives how can you draw in your hands on people who are disengaging with church and you can engage them and get them to do stuff? And finally, we need to make time because if we don't make the time for this stuff, it will never happen. So if you'd like to engage with the resources and find out more, uh, there's a sheet, uh, the paper with the uh, everything I've said today. It's got different examples in the paper too. You can find uh, the uh, information on my blog. You can either Google Honest About My Faith and click on uh, Helping People Learn in Church. If you've got a QR smartphone thing, you can scan that. If you don't know what that is, you probably haven't got it. You can scan that, it'll take you to the right place. Or you can type in the um, web addressy thing there, and that will take you to the uh, right place too. And incidentally, on my blog, um, there's a section on creative communication, and I try and share some of these ideas. So if you want to follow that, or you can use the search box, or you can message me through the blog or email me, and say, I'm doing a service on this, and I'd really like to do something clever. Uh, message me, I'll do my best to help you, usually by asking my wife, and, uh, and I'll get back to you if I can. So hope you found that helpful. If there's any questions, you can catch me in a day, but otherwise we've got to go. Uh, and get on through the next section. So thank you very much. I'm so sorry that was run because I've broken all my rules. It's the only way I can do it.